Craig, don't start. Craig, we need to demote Danielle and welcome Jeff. How are you? We're good. Peter's good. behind screen two. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Excited. Is, we're excited too. If you need anything, just um, chat who he events or is Minnie's texting me too. Okay, very good. Great. Okay, great. So Craig, we are ready to go. And I got your tech here. Hi, I'm Rob Langdon, and I'm a proud supporter of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and a member of the corporation. I'm also a member of Pui Dallas, the Texas-based chapter group of ocean lovers presenting this evening's program. Like other Hui chapters, Hui New England, Hui New York, and Hui National, our Hui Dallas members make annual gifts of $5,000 more to enable Hui scientists and engineers to explore, discover, and understand our planet. We also bring important programs and speakers like tonight's to Dallas for cocktails and conversation. On behalf of Huey Dallas, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rob. And thank you to the Huey Dallas chapter for your support and for being the presenting sponsor of tonight's event. My name is Veronique LaCapra, and I'd like to welcome all of you to tonight's Ocean Encounters virtual series from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, or HUI as it is sometimes called. Our series is made possible by Dalio Philanthropies and the Avatar Alliance Foundation. Tonight, we have what's sure to be a fascinating conversation with HUI President and Director Peter Domenical and Columbia University Professor and Senior United Nations Advisor Jeffrey Sachs. They'll be discussing the theme of sea change, solutions for an ocean planet. Before we get to the main event, I'd like to find out where all of you in the audience are tuning in from tonight. If you've joined us on Zoom, you should see a pop-up poll on your screen asking you to indicate the region where you live and are watching us from tonight. The poll choices don't cover everywhere, but please pick the one that's closest to where you are. While that poll is running, here are some tips on how you can optimize your event experience with us. At various intervals throughout the evening, our guests will be taking questions from all of you. If you are joining us on Zoom and you'd like to participate in this live Q&A, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question in the window that appears. You might be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but please use the Q&A button instead. I'll be gathering your questions behind the scenes and coming back on screen to share them with Jeff and Peter. We often get many more questions than we have time to answer, unfortunately, so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we're live. You can ask questions at any time, starting now. I also want to let you know that we are recording this event, and that recording will be made available on the hui.edu website. And I think we'll be seeing the poll results here shortly. Here they are. Um, as expected, we have quite a lot of people tuning in from the Eastern US, but there's a good smattering from across the country. And we even have, even have some folks joining us from Europe, uh, Central or South America, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia Pacific. So we've pretty much got the globe covered tonight. That's terrific. Um, and just to let you know, more than 1,000 people registered for tonight's primetime event. So you're in good company. Welcome to all of you. All right, let's get the conversation started. Humanity is at a crossroads and, a, and the choices we make today will resonate for generations to come. Fortunately, we have many brilliant minds, tools and resources at our disposal and a growing body of science-based knowledge about our ocean and our planet to help us make the best decisions. Tonight, I have the honor of welcoming Columbia University professor and senior UN advisor, Jeffrey Sachs, and Huey president and director, Peter Domenical. They'll be exploring the paths ahead for humanity and for life on earth at this time of widespread environmental change. So no pressure. Uh, before we dive into all that, I'd just like to give an audience a little bit of an introduction to both Jeff and Peter. 
Jeff is a world-renowned professor of economics, a best-selling author, and a syndicated columnist. He's widely considered to be one of the world's leading experts on economic development, global macroeconomics, and the fight against poverty, and has twice been named among Times Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders. Jeff spent over 20 years as a professor at Harvard University before joining Columbia in 2002, where he directed the Earth Institute and currently holds the title of university professor. Peter Domenichel is a marine geologist and paleo-oceanographer who studies deep sea sediments as archives of past climate change and draws connections to the human dimensions of climate change today. He just took on the leadership of Hui at the beginning of this month, coming to us from Columbia University where he worked with Jeff at the Earth Institute. As a chaired professor at Columbia's Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, Peter served as Dean of Science and founded Columbia's Center for Climate and Life, a research accelerator that mobilizes scientists and other experts to explore how climate affects essential aspects of human life, including food security, water, shelter, and sustainable energy solutions. A warm welcome to you both. There we go. Great. There. We're there. Here we All are. Right. <laughs> All right. Peter, Jeff, why don't you back. get us started? Um, and um, don't forget to bring me back from time to time to pass along questions from our audience. Will do, Veronique, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Jeffrey, it is such a delight to see you tonight. And uh, I gather you just got off a plane um, as expected. <laughs> Well, and, um, Peter, let me say what a delight it is to see you in this new capacity uh, as uh, president of uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic. I could not be more thrilled for the whole world and for you and for all of the lovers of Hui. This is a, a really fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, thing that uh, you've uh, taken the leadership. I can assure everybody uh, you've got a great president of, of, of Hui. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. And it's just, you know, it's such an honor to have you here tonight with us. Um, this is uh, my first Ocean Encounters, and it's just uh, absolutely fitting that uh, it, you and I are, are here tonight. Um, you've been such an inspiration to me over your career, and uh, you were once a boss, uh, now a colleague, and always a friend. So uh, really happy to start this discussion with you. Um, so I thought for tonight we could uh, spend some time actually maybe focusing on your new book. Um, I just happened to uh, bring it oh, up. Oh, good. <laughs> That's so kind. And, uh, even complete with dog ears and the rest. <laughs> and um, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, we could have focus a discussion on uh, some of the challenges and then some of the resources that we can bring to bear. And then what some of the solutions might look like as we uh, look to, for solutions on an ocean planet. And, uh, you know, you, you lay out in the book really in an expert way, these uh, seven ages of globalization and uh, beginning with one that is near and dear to my heart, uh, yes. the Neolithic. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought it would be a great way to kind of get the conversation started to get us all in the same uh, frame of mind uh, uh, as we move forward uh, with the discussion. So if you might sort of uh, give some ideas about these distinct stages of human society and um, you know, how, where are we now and how do we get here? Th thanks so much. Uh, that's a nice graphic too. I appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, not not mine. Yours and, and well done. Our expert team. Uh, my, the, the argument of, of the book uh, is based on uh, really my experience and my thinking uh, over the last 35 years, I, I would say, trying to figure out how uh, the uh, different parts of the world fit together in a globalized economy, because I come at this first as an economist, uh, but then uh, over time, understanding you can't be just an economist if you want to understand the dynamics. Uh, you better at least know an expert oceanographer or two uh, to, to help on that and understand the climate uh, disease epidemiology and the other shapers of, of the world. But when I started as an economic advisor 35 years ago, 
uh, working in Latin America, then in Eastern Europe, uh, then in India and China, I, I thought globalization was uh, occurring for the first time before my eyes. And I can say 35 years later, I now understand much better than I did then, uh, that uh, we've been a globalized species uh, for, I would say, uh, somewhere around 50,000 years or so since uh, 50,000 uh, 50, since the great dispersion uh, out, of, uh, out of Africa, uh, that is our common home. And uh, your work, uh, of course, illuminated uh, dynamics within Africa itself for the shaping of the first empires uh, uh, along the Nile and, and so on, absolutely pathbreaking, fascinating work. But I have tried to understand uh, in this book and thinking about this uh, throughout my career, what are the shapers of, of the changes of uh, global society? And I would say the most fundamental uh, driver of change is technology, the way we learn to do things, uh, whether it is uh, writing uh, and uh, the inventions uh, of an alphabet uh, and a script uh, or other ways of communicating or one of the great breakthroughs of human history was the domestication of the horse, uh, which we presume to be about 5,000 years ago, uh, around 3000 uh, BC completely transformative of society, of politics, of warfare, of uh, economies. And I trace seven ages, which I uh, think can help us to understand that changing the dynamic. The first is uh, the, the age of uh, the uh, migration, mostly on foot uh, and, and a bit on raft, uh, as uh, humanity spread out from Africa to uh, almost every ecological niche uh, on the planet. The second, uh, at the end of the Ice Age and the beginning of our Holocene, uh, which, which you've uh, taught me a lot about, uh, the beginnings of agriculture, which uh, developed independently in several parts of the world, uh, the Fertile Crescent uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, the Near East, uh, in uh, China, in uh, the Americas, uh, in the Andes uh, region, Central America also. Uh, a third uh, stage, which I regard as uh, quite fundamental, which was the horse domestication. Ironically, uh, by the time that occurred in the old world, uh, the wild horse population had been driven to extinction in the new world. And so the uh, native uh, Amerindian population in the New World did not have horses uh, between 10,000 uh, BC and 1492 uh, when uh, the Europeans uh, brought horses back to the New World. And I argue in the book that that was an absolutely fundamental fact of uh, what held back a lot of development in the New World compared to the Old World dynamics. The fourth uh, age uh, is uh, the classical age. It's got many names, but it's the age of uh, the great uh, battles of uh, Greece uh, and Persia uh, in, uh, in the Persian uh, Wars, uh, the uh, period of uh, the uh, empires of Alexander the Great, uh, and then the formative empires of uh, Roman Empire, uh, the Han Empire in China, but that imperial classic age uh, now drawing on the great advances of communications, of transport, of horse uh, cavalry uh, and uh, horse uh, um, power, uh, changing again the scale of uh, trade globally and the scale of political entities. The next chapter is the ocean age uh, in its uh, most fundamental political sense it's, I think, notable for all ocean lovers uh, what Adam Smith, the founder of uh, modern economics, wrote, uh, one of my favorite quotations uh, in economics. He said that uh, the two most significant events in the history of mankind were the discoveries of uh, the, uh, the, the uh, naval uh, passages from uh, Europe to uh, the Americas and from Europe to uh, uh, to uh, the Indian Ocean uh, and Asia, 
around the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, and he said, this is the first time that we've really been, the whole world has been united uh, in uh, trade and in commerce. Of course, it got united in many other ways, unfortunately, also in slavery and transmission of disease uh, with the uh, uh, loss of uh, perhaps 90% of the indigenous American populations after the introduction of smallpox and other old world diseases with the arrival of uh, the European uh, conquerors. Uh, but that formed the global world uh, in, in a way, uh, it's, the, it's the early modern world as we know it. And for an economist, it's also very interesting because it was the first uh, multinational enterprises, the East India Company, uh, the Dutch East India Company. It was the first time you had global scale business and uh, these businesses were such big businesses, they had their armies with them, of right. course, also. They were not uh, simply businesses, they were conquering powers. The next breakthrough, uh, I, I think uh, the, the decisive, probably the most transformative single technology since agriculture uh, was uh, James Watt's steam engine. It changed everything, but it made the industrial age. The industrial age meant the fossil fuel age, the fossil fuel age, we learned about 100 years after it started uh, that it was also going to be the climate change age uh, because uh, the great uh, earth scientists, uh, Tyndall uh, and uh, um, uh, Arrhenius uh, and others, began to put together the pieces of a puzzle of how the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, and oceans interact. Uh, and uh, why Earth is warmer than the moon, for example, because of the greenhouse effect. And then Arrhenius, uh, already 125 years ago, uh, writing, humans are going to warm the planet because we're burning so much coal. And th that is the legacy of the industrial age. And then the seventh age, I argue, uh, really started around the beginning of the new century and the new millennium, the digital technologies that have gone into overdrive since COVID-19 um, are deeply transforming every aspect of society in a completely fundamental way. And we're living it obviously day to day right now. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, uh, McKinsey is quoted in uh, the Financial Times as saying that the rate of digitalization during the COVID period is 25 times what it had been in pre-COVID. And I think that that is certainly our Zoom presence is, <laughs> has gone up 25 times. But I argue that this is a, a what we call in economics a general purpose technology. Uh, basically, the idea that all information can be coded as zeros and ones, uh, and therefore, uh, stored and manipulated on uh, uh, microprocessing units and transmitted through fiber and through microwaves, connecting the whole world in data. And now we have, uh, it used to be as of 2016, that one year of data was more than all of the data transmission of humanity in history up until 2016. Now it's, uh, it's, it's a few weeks that uh, constitutes all of the data ever before, and we're still on this accelerating path of a completely digitalized society. It means a lot because we're now battling, uh, well, first we have the opportunity to make some tremendous positive breakthroughs, but we are also, seeing all of the huge flux and threat and disruption that has come at the interface of each of these ages, changing geopolitics, changing uh, organization of society, changing relative power and income distribution within our societies. This is a big deal. And COVID is, of course, adding to the drama tremendously. Uh, but the drama was there even before uh, this epidemic started. Mm. Mm. Well, thanks for that, uh, Jeff. But just, um, you know, one of the uh, 
underpinning themes of, uh, of the book is this idea of accelerating change. And with that, the expanding geographic, economic, military, communications uh, dimensions that are attached to that. And um, you know, one of the things that um, I found um, really resonant um, in your chapter two was uh, you know, on the focus of, on uh, our early history, our, our migration out of Africa is the uh, intense narrative in there of uh, adaptation to change. And that's what sort of peopled the world was this uh, diaspora of uh, anatomically modern humans to populate the world. And that's sort of the beginning of your book. And then at the end, you know, we have this ever increasing pace of uh, interaction and of globalization. And, you know, it, 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 it leaves us in this place of, you know, where we stand now as a society in the digital age. And, and you discussed in this some of the big challenges that, that face us um, involving sustainability and governance and, uh, and equity and peace. Uh, I was wondering if you could sort of comment on that mainly as just a a way for us to, to look at our present or our near future within the context of this past that you've sketched out for us? You know, uh, 50 years ago, uh, when I was uh, in high school, uh, a formative book uh, that I read, uh, and it is 50 years ago this year, was a, a book by Alvin Toffler called Future Shock. Uh, and uh, of course, that became uh, uh, a common phrase uh, in our vocabulary, but his uh, claim in 1970 was that the pace of change had accelerated so dramatically that we were, uh, as human beings, experiencing something that no previous generation had experienced, and it would come with incredible uh, uh, disorientation. Uh, and I went back to read it again, actually, last week. Uh, because I wanted to see how much he got right. And it's an amazing <laughs> book, actually. And he followed it uh, 10 years later with a book called The Third Wave, uh, which was uh, about the digital age. And it's, it's actually very interesting uh, because uh, he was obviously a very, very astute observer. But he did something that I think is very clever for us in thinking about the kind of question you're asking. In 1980, in, in uh, this third wave book, which now we call the fourth industrial revolution, uh, um, but he called it the third wave, uh, he hung out uh, in Palo Alto uh, in the early days of uh, some of the tech revolution, and he saw what the future was going to be. Uh, and so he talked about the internet before we knew that there would be the internet. And he talked about the kind of communications we had and social media and got an enormous number of things right. And uh, I was thinking, how could he be so good at this? And it, it comes to an expression uh, that is known to sci-fi fans uh, of William Gibson, uh, who said, uh, and famously, but wonderfully, uh, the future is already here, just unevenly. Uh, so you, <laughs> you can find, you know, the few uh, niches of the beachheads of the future. And if you're really an astute futurologist, as Alvin Toffler was, you can see that. Now, that I think is one part of the idea. So I want to say a word about what, what the beachheads show us about where we're going. Um, but uh, the second ex expression around this line that I love, uh, which uh, one of my teachers, uh, E.O. Wilson uh, at Harvard, uh, used in a preface to one of my books. Uh, and it, it, I, I, to me, it's a very deep uh, idea. Uh, Ed Wilson uh, wrote, so we have stumbled into the 21st century with our Stone Age emotions our medieval institutions and our godlike technologies. And this is very pertinent for understanding that uh, the technologies are so dramatically accelerating at Moore's law, basically uh, doubling every uh, now 18 to 24 months. But our emotional makeup is really 50,000 years ago on the African savanna. That's where our deep emotions and our, uh, uh, you know, probably 
the, the last stages of uh, modern uh, brain structure development and so forth took place. And our institutions in the United States, uh, for example, 1787 uh, was the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia that designed our institutions. And I don't think that they uh, properly took into account what the internet was going to enable <laughs> or what social media would mean or how we could have uh, online participation. And what it means is that our institutions inevitably are going to lag this dramatic rate of technological change. And so we're scrambling emotionally and institutionally to catch up with technological change. Here's what I think it means uh, in, in part. Uh, I uh, like to, as you know, uh, fly under the flag of sustainable development. And uh, that, that's a uh, kind of the slogan that uh, I have uh, long glommed onto. And when I came to Columbia 18 years ago, I said, please uh, name me professor of sustainable development. They said, what's that? I said, well, <laughs> just uh, let me have the name and we'll figure it out. Um, and so I am professor of sustainable development. And what it means is that we have to combine the economic, the social, and the environmental challenges that we face. And because we are constantly out of kilter on this, uh, things don't take care of themselves. So this digital age, which of course builds on still the industrial 200 years, first we're facing mega environmental crises, uh, largely anthropogenic, largely human driven. Uh, the, probably, well, the most notable now is zoonotic disease, uh, mm -hmm. is COVID-19, uh, which came from uh, a, uh, a passage of uh, this coronavirus from uh, horseshoe bat populations to humans, uh, probably somewhere in Southwest China. And probably several years ago, by the time we completely unravel this, it's probably not something that started uh, in January, but probably something that was not picked up as a new disease for a while. That's quite typical that you find that the period goes uh, back a bit. Mm. But there are, of course, multiple other cascading environmental crises, all with a sh very strong ocean uh, uh, feature uh, to them, climate change, uh, fundamentally implicated uh, in the ocean uh, atmospheric dynamics in countless ways that uh, you could uh, endlessly educate us about. Uh, there is the massive crisis of loss of biodiversity, also both terrestrial and marine, uh, but with the overfishing of just about every major fishery in the world, uh, it's reached uh, dire, dire limits and complicated by the warming of the oceans and the changing of, uh, of uh, habitats and uh, ecological niches, and then pollution. And also the oceans are being, of course, uh, completely overwhelmed by the plastics pollution. We have uh, eutrophication in just about every estuary uh, in the world, very serious uh, dead zones, hypoxic zones, and so on. So those environmental challenges are going to continue to worsen almost no matter what, because even if we get completely on top of it, just the legacy of the feedback systems are gonna to continue to mean uh, that we'll have a warmer planet for decades to come as this uh, uh, continues to unfold. Um, that's one part. Then technology always has uh, multiple aspects to it. On the one side with digital, we can do a lot more than we could do before smart machines, remote sensing, uh, satellites uh, mapping the whole world uh, twice a day uh, in uh, low earth orbital satellites and you know an overflow of information and data if we can use it properly. That's one very important positive side. But then huge uh, uh, forces of uh, inequality because uh, the digital world is great for the things I do. I talk for a living uh, and, I talk, and I talk with other people for a living and I sit at a computer. Uh, and so uh, nothing that I do actually, although I, I like to travel, uh, now I, I meet 
see more colleagues around the world by the day this way. Uh, so in this sense, uh, the digitalization under COVID has been actually a boost for a significant part of the economy. But then people who live in the, not the virtual world as avatars like we do, uh, or I do, but uh, actually uh, work in shops or factories or frontline workers, it's been devastating exactly. uh, for, for many. So the inequalities have soared during this period. And like any technology, there's the dark side of the technology, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, not only the fake news and the social media and so forth, but really uh, the uh, rapid militarization of this technology. Uh, it's everywhere, yeah. I'm afraid, mm -hmm. and I see it everywhere mm -hmm. in, in the policy discussions. Mm -hmm. And then I think the, the final point that I would mention that is quite fundamental, I'm all in favor of it. Many others are against it, but this is an equalizing technology in the sense that China is absolutely uh, uh, leveraging the uh, digital age for rapid development and a lot of catching up. And as an economist, I say bravo, uh, because uh, poverty has uh, basically come down to almost nothing. Uh, but from the geopolitical point of view, it's definitely raising tensions. I don't agree with those tensions necessarily, but we are seeing a significant change of geopolitics underway right now. Absolutely. Uh, right. And uh, that, that's a part of any of those ages. There's always a change of power structure that goes along with this. You know, what did industrialization really do? It created the British Empire in its globally inclusive form. Uh, what did uh, the ocean age do? Of course, it created the first global empires of, uh, of Spain uh, and to a lesser extent of uh, Portugal. Uh, what did uh, the classic age do? It made the Han and the Roman Empire. So we are surely seeing a change of the geopolitics and uh, all of the difficulties with that now. Yep, certainly. Um, I, you know, I think Veronique has some questions for us. We've got... Uh... 15 questions coming in from the audience. So we'll Good. break it up into a few sections. <laughs> Hi, Veronique. <laughs> okay. Um, I actually wanted to first pivot a little bit to the ocean. Uh, Jeff mentioned the ocean's role in, in many of these, uh, both in, in suffering the impacts of uh, some of the environmental challenges we face and also the ocean's role in climate. And I I was curious, uh, Peter, what, some, what you see as some of the big challenges that are holding us back in ocean science and what overcoming them would contribute to our evolution as a society. Right, so uh, very much following uh, Jeffrey's uh, theme that, that really is the backbone of his book. Um, you know, when actually, when I started my career in oceanography, uh, you know, we would go out to sea on, on ships, go to a specific point in, on the ocean with maybe a dozen other scientists, maybe two dozen if it was a larger ship, uh, and really get a measurement from a single location. Whereas, uh, whereas now we've got uh, autonomous vehicles that are measuring throughout the oceans, but it's still incomplete. We've only discovered or, or ventured even uh, into just a fraction of the ocean, particularly at depth. Um, and so the future is very much, I think, as, as Jeffrey describes in the, in the larger uh, macro scale uh, is a networked ocean that is a way to actually monitor the ocean by measuring it and uh, you know the the economic adage you can't uh, uh, manage what you don't um, uh, measure uh, is very is absolutely true for the oceans and so to monitor some of these changes and how they impact things that we care about like uh, food uh, intensity of storms the security of coastal cities all these things are very much dependent on our ability to to monitor such a vast three quarters you know, surface area of the planet. Absolutely. We also, uh, both uh, Peter and I had two uh, uh, absolutely remarkable uh, climate gurus as colleagues, uh, Wally Broker, who was uh, unbelievable uh, <laughs> in cre creativity uh, over 60 years plus, uh, but who mapped 
uh, the ocean circulation uh, and explained it uh, together with uh, colleagues uh, uh, such as Peter uh, at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory and Woods Hole, um, uh, you know, warned that uh, climate change would uh, deeply affect the ocean circulation. And I believe we're seeing some of that uh, slowing circulation and with the really important ramifications. And uh, our other uh, guru uh, uh, climate colleague uh, who I love, but always leaves me uh, kind of shaking in, in terror is Jim Hansen. Uh, who is you know, one of the world's great climate scientists. Uh, and uh, I always said he's a very soft-spoken, gentle <laughs> soul. But every time for the 16 years that I was, uh, or 14 years that I was head of the Earth Institute, I <laughs> he'd just come up to me and say, Jeff, it's worse than we thought. <laughs> you know, so, uh, it's uh, happening faster it's happening deeper. And I, I was with Jim, it was one of the last uh, trips that I took pre-COVID. Uh, we were at uh, Boston College for a seminar together. And sure enough, Jim came up to me and said, uh, Jeff, it's worse than we thought. Uh, the evidence of the uh, warming and the melting of uh, the underwater uh, ice buttressing of the West Antarctic ice sheet is, uh, happening even faster than we feared. And uh, that whole bulwark against several meters sea level rise of uh, this, uh, you can describe it better than I can, mm -hmm. Peter, but uh, as I understand it, basically uh, almost the, the, the underwater uh, dam holding back the glaciers from uh, sliding into the Southern Ocean. Uh, we're losing that and we need to understand right. that. And uh, only the oceanographers can tell us what's going <laughs> on. The, the politicians can't, that's for sure. Yep, it's, it's the ocean blowtorch from below. That's the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, one of the things I've noticed since in my, in my three weeks of being here at Huey is this amazing blend of science and engineering and technical talent that is applied to imaging this process. And it's, uh, it's really amazing to see uh, you know, firsthand how our scientists are, are uh, really revealing this process. Uh, but, you know, is this a good time, I think, uh, Jeff, perhaps to transition maybe to some discussion about solutions, because we can't leave everyone uh, with, with just the, uh, the handbag of, uh, of the troubles. I think it's really a good time to focus on uh, the UN uh, Ocean Decade. I think, uh, you know, that is, you know, it's incredibly fortuitous with my own timing. Uh, begins in 2021, ends in 2030, pretty much coinciding with my tenure as president and director at Woods Hole. But more largely, it's a call to the entire global ocean science community and the private sector for action. And uh, you know, relative to SDG, Sustainable Development Goal 14, um, and uh, I think this really um, impressive, bold, indeed courageous call to action coming from the UN, uh, you know, when I read it, it really differed to me in tone and intent than anything I've seen from them before. I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, th thank you. And I'm gonna count on you for uh, guidance uh, because uh, I, I can, uh, I think, help to uh, put the ideas in front of uh, the UN member states uh, and uh, the president of the General Assembly and the Secretary General and the UN uh, agencies. Uh, so I really am, am going to need your help on this uh, so that we make the most of, uh, of the decade of the oceans. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are uh, both uh, a bold global commitment uh, and also a kind of cry of the heart, I would say, of the 193 UN member states. Uh, they were adopted in September 2015, and then a few weeks after that, the Paris Climate Agreement was signed uh, on December 12, uh, 2015 in Paris. So there's bookends of uh, a few weeks, two major global agreements. The idea of the Sustainable Development Goals is, uh, as I mentioned, to combine the economic, the social, and the environmental objectives of world society at all levels from individual cities or uh, coastal communities up through uh, global uh, treaty cooperation. And as you noted, SDG 14 
is uh, the uh, marine ecosystems. Uh, it's the oceans, uh, it's uh, the other marine environments. Uh, it's uh, partner is uh, SDG 15, which is the terrestrial biomes uh, and ecosystems. And very importantly and fundamentally is SDG 13, which is uh, climate safety. So the idea is uh, that we need holistic approaches to solve mega problems that we've never seen before. We need holistic approaches to solve the climate problem, the uh, biodiversity challenge, the pollution problem, but in a way that is also fair, socially right. just, and ending poverty, not increasing poverty. And as uh, you and, uh, and uh, all the participants uh, this evening uh, know, uh, we need the oceans for countless vital life support services, including our food supplies, our protein, uh, which uh, comes from the oceans uh, and is imperiled because of uh, the overharvesting, the pollution, mm. Uh, the climate change uh, and and so on. So, in terms of solutions, I think uh, the the word that I use more than any other word in uh, this uh, challenge is the word pathway. Mm. I, I ask, what is the path of change that we need between now and the mid century to be able to solve these problems? Because we can't solve them overnight. Uh, our challenges are deeply embedded in technology, in infrastructure, uh, in our training and knowledge. And so we need a path to safety. When it comes to climate, we need to decarbonize the energy system worldwide by mid-century. One of the breakthroughs last month at the UN General Assembly was that President Xi Jinping, for the first time ever, said China would do this by 2060, I want to nudge them forward to 2050, <laughs> but still was a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And we need the US to join on that. And Europe has announced a European Green Deal to decarbonize by 2050. Think of how much this would help uh, because uh, warming at least would have a fighting chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C and if we then move to negative emissions afterwards by uh, rebuilding forests, reforesting, afforesting, storing soil the carbon. Oceans have a big role in uh, this too. Yes, yeah. uh, all of this uh, and, and oceans uh, taking up uh, some of the uh, atmospheric uh, CO2, we could just make that final <laughs> turn so that we avoid disaster. And I think that that's one of the most important points. And then uh, I want to look to your guidance on what, of course, we face the massive pollution problems. This comes back to many other problems. Uh, so much of the pollution is secondary yeah. agriculture, for example. Mm. Uh, it's runoff of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus from the uh, 100 to 150 million tons of fertilizer that are put on uh, the soils around the world and end up collecting in, uh, in the estuaries. Um, so that's a second major area. We so, need to stop the overfishing, obviously. Mm -hmm. One of the, I think, really important, very, very basic ideas is a lot of the overfishing is illegal fishing. It's uh, undocumented uh, uh, and illegal fishing. But now we have satellites that are tracking every ship in the world uh, and we ought to be able to use real-time data to manage the enforcement of, uh, of restrictions on fishing that are needed to keep fisheries within a sustainable uh, boundary. Mm. So finding practical pathways to solutions, I think, is essential. So, you know, as, as, a, as an economist advising ocean and climate scientists, but also, you know, engaging in this really global question, how do you think we can get society to recognize the cost of environmental degradation in the oceans? In other words, to, you know, putting a price on it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a shared resource. It doesn't really belong to anyone. And so how do we build this collective sense of, of ownership? And, and, you know, I, I think I know where you're going to go on this, but I, I think it really is instructive for what the kinds of solutions look like. 
Well, I, I think in general, uh, if you look at uh, the opinion surveys, which I do uh, several times an hour these days, by the way, but in general, I, I look at them a lot. Uh, people know that we have an environmental crisis that's exactly. very serious. Yep. Uh, in America, we're at 70 or 75 percent consensus now. This is serious and real. What people want to know more than whether we have a crisis or not is the what to do. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I think, and my uh, answer to that is really simple. I'm an economist, so I have no idea. So what, when I want to know what to do about the oceans, I call Peter Domenico. This is easy. <laughs> and and it's, it, it is actually literally the case, by the way, that my belief in working on these issues for uh, 30 years, uh, pretty much nonstop, is that we need our knowledge communities to be presenting solutions, mm. uh, to be saying, here is the problem, here is where it comes from, but here is what to do about it. And it's very practical, and it'll make your, in general, most of these solutions will make our lives better. Right. It's not just pain. It's just better management of resources, you know, less waste, less destruction, smarter ways to, to do things. On the climate issue, uh, where I've you know, been involved in public policy debates on the energy system for a quarter century, I continue to believe that while there are very strong vested interests, fossil fuels, we have to do this and so forth, because places either produce them or people own stock in them or they work in uh, energy companies. Um, I think the most important single thing to tell the American people is, you know, you can have your transport, you can have your lights, you can have your life, you can still fly airplanes and we can still do this. Uh, we can have a good life, mm. which we like, but we can do it with zero emission energy rather than with the kind of uh, primary energy sources that are going to drive us to, to ruin. And but it's worth, it's worth knowing that, uh, you know, uh, the Dallas chapter of who is, uh, is hosting us tonight, uh, as one of the nations or as the nation's leader in, in wind energy. Absolutely. The amazing build out of wind all through Texas, by the way, and uh, <laughs> between solar and wind, there's so much renewable potential. It's incredible. Right. So um, I think we have some questions that are rolling in, just blowing up, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Good. We have to keep up with it. So Veronique, uh, over to you for some questions. Yeah. So I guess I was curious about uh, what do we think that uh, the most important scientific answers are, or, or what are the what are the scientific questions that we need to answer in order to get to a sustainable future, particularly with respect to the ocean? Mm. Uh, can, uh, I, yeah. can I ask uh, my specific questions, uh, which is uh, what, what should we know and how should we study these uh, absolutely uh, vital uh, parameter questions of ocean circulation, uh, ocean acidification, uh, the uh, uh, ice sheet uh, dynamics, mm. uh, especially Antarctica, um, and you know, we what should the oceanography community be saying to the public uh, about uh, what kind of measurements? Is it satellites? Is it more of these autonomous uh, diving vessels uh, that are uh, looking at uh, the uh, temperature gradients and energy absorption? Because you tell me, I will be your mouthpiece, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's you know, one of the most Im impressive things that I've come across in the last three weeks. And, and Jeff, as a, as a geochemist, you know, we, when we looked at the global carbon cycle, we always looked at how the, you know, the atmosphere or the ocean is taking up 30% of the atmospheric burden that's kind of linked to our carbon emissions. So the ocean's doing this job for free, you know, it's a, or not for free, but uh, ocean acidification is a result of it. But, um, you know, it is taking up 30% of the CO2 and it's taking up 90 plus percent of the excess heating. Um, so in many ways, you know, the ocean is really a hero, not a, not a victim. Uh, you know, our colleague, uh, Ayanna Johnson gave voice to that 
idea. And it's, you know, and it's really a very different narrative for the ocean. So rather than looking at it as this besieged, uh, too big to fail kind of concept, it's actually, you know, that's really doing us a solid here in terms of uh, uh, being the flywheel for climate and carbon capture. But one of the discoveries that came up on me was that um, uh, we have this project here called the Twilight Zone, uh, which is looking at uh, this layer of ocean that's about a half a mile down in the water column. It's below the level where the sunlight comes. And here's the largest concentration of biomass in the planet. It's the largest animal migration on the planet. It's this huge carbon uh, source for the planet. It's like the soils are feeding trees. This is the, the carbon that's feeding the, the life in the ocean. And, you know, I just, I had no appreciation for this, but it's a fishery. It's being used for fish meal. And so these, these you know, dense populations of organisms are being vacuumed up by these illegal fishing vessels um, and being turned to fish meal. But what is amazing is that, you know, when you think of a forest, what's, what's um, fulfilling that forest is the soils. What's fulfilling the surface productivity of the ocean is this twilight zone. And we're you know, uh, fishing it with abandon in a completely unregulated way. And this is literally the lungs of the planet. And you know, I, this kind of took my breath away when I joined on here because uh, I guess when you come to a new place, you learn new things. And this is uh, my early schooling as it were. Amazing. Veronique? Amazing. Uh, yeah, there's lots and lots of questions coming in here. So let's see. Um, there's quite a few people asking about uh, specific technologies such as aquaculture and ways to prevent ocean acidification and sort of wondering what the opportunities are for technology-based solutions to achieve sustainability. Right. So, um, you know, one of the, uh, I mentioned my early history as an oceanographer going out on ships, sort of one ship at a time and spending time at sea with a dozen other people. Um, we're now transitioning to something called the networked ocean, which is really trying to illuminate this three quarters of the ocean. Uh, it would be this panel, I guess, over here on the right, where we have autonomous vehicles communicating with ships, communicating with satellites and um, actually probing the ocean depths, basically to provide this kind of monitoring that we enjoy on land. Uh, communications in the oceans are a lot more uh, difficult. It's a much harsher environment. And it's a huge place to monitor. Uh, the surface, we can do really well with satellites, but that gets you down to about a centimeter below the, the surface of the ocean. And so the rest of the ocean, the two miles below it, are basically opaque to us. And we're clueless about what's happening in many of these areas. And so these questions that Jeff raised are foremost on our minds. You know, how can we monitor these uh, essentials of human sustainability that um, are, are presented to us by the oceans uh, in a way and on a time scale that can inform us? And it really comes down to accelerating the science that we need for solutions. And um, that's, uh, that's why I'm here. Is, uh, and I think that's why I think many of us are engaged in this kind of effort is to make it a, a real uh, a global effort to advance the science we need. And, and Peter, I, you know, I don't know what the state of, uh, of discussion and specificity is uh, with NOAA or with other uh, you know, major partners, but the more that that uh, model of how the networked ocean should be really rolled out, uh, you know, literally, this is a very good time for that I think because uh, again, you know, if, if the U.S. Uh, uh, finally uh, buys into this, and I hope that it will in the uh, next administration, um, these investments could be really paramount uh, for uh, the measurement and the implementation of the international agreements. But the only ones that will know how to do this are the oceanographers. Uh, you know, it's uh, just no way that a policy community could figure this out. And I think it's extremely important that the oceanographers come forward and say, this is what we need and why we need it. And I think there'll be a very significant resonance mm. for that. Uh, and it's extremely timely. Yep. And as you discussed, you know, taking it that next step and actually engaging 
global partners along the way. I mean, you know, these, this knowledge is valuable to all of society across boundaries. So yeah, and and we saw, you know, I think one of Jim Hansen's great contributions. Uh, Wally uh, also, uh, you know, Jim Hansen was very uh, specific with NASA. We need this satellite, this specific satellite capacity, and uh, that's what's enabling us to measure, say, the change of the ice sheets right now, or uh, m many of these other things. So I think. Uh, you know, the oceanographers can really say we need right. the, and, and the autonomy of vessels is something new. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's obvious in a way. Uh, now mm -hmm. you, we really can. It's nice to have uh, the, uh, the navigators on board, but uh, frankly, we don't need it right now because uh, it's possible to have uh, whole fleets of uh, autonomy now doing very sophisticated things. Exactly. Uh, Veronique, we're, we're going to let you Ask us some questions and we'll promise shorter <laughs> answers, maybe. Well, this is a question that was asked earlier in the evening from, from Gray, um, who, this was back when you were talking about the seven stages of, of human society that we've gone through. And Gray was wondering what the next one might be uh, in your- yeah. You never get that question, right? <laughs> I, I'm uh, keen on this one, which I think is still in its, uh, you know, formative stages uh, working out uh, working out well. Uh, to my mind, this digital age, if we're smart, if we're cooperative, uh, if we use uh, all of the wisdom now of re low cost renewable energy, networked uh, monitoring systems and so forth, e-schooling, telemedicine, e-governance, I think there's a fantastic opportunity for uh, better lives uh, through this. Uh, also precision agriculture. So many things can be done if we view this, if we take it positively, if we get uh, universal access to the digital world so it's not a new divide, but something that is actually unifying so that every child can have the benefits of uh, education or uh, other services uh, online. Um, I think there's great possibility of improved uh, education, health, economic productivity, and something I like a lot, leisure time, uh, that uh, if the machines are doing the work for us, uh, uh, we, we can actually have more time to uh, do the, the things that we'd like to do, whether it's uh, studying or reading or uh, talking at the coffee shop and so forth. So uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, to put it uh, simply, we're not uh, close to the A stage yet. We're uh, eighth age. We're really working through the ramifications of a tremendous technological change right now mm. that is huge. And it's the disruptive effects got tremendously accelerated by this uh, pandemic, but we're going to continue to see huge changes in how we live, how we work, whether we go to offices, uh, how much time uh, we're devoting mm -hmm. to different activities, whether we shop in shops uh, or whether Jeff Bezos sends us everything we need. <laughs> Uh, and so I think uh, working out the ramifications of the digital, digital age is going to keep us occupied for mm. some decades ahead. And, you know, one I, of the things I, I think that's, that's a draw on that, too, is, is, um, is that the technology advancement is also, uh, you know, this, this rapid multiplication, uh, you know, akin to Moore's law, is also uh, occurring within the energy sector across, you know, photovoltaics or wind or battery storage as well. And so... You know, if you just look at those learning rates, um, the cost curves for those, uh, you know, it's in our lifetimes, Jeff, that, you know, we're, you know, it's now. Actually, everything, even from 2014 or 2015, we've exceeded the mark when it comes to what the technological possibilities are. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way in our society or our mm. politics or, or uh, other things. And this year we're in a, you know, a huge setback and a big upheaval. But uh, to read the weekly uh, issue of Nature or Science and see the acceleration of uh, the capacities, 
It's almost every day. Yesterday, I don't, I don't even remember offhand the technology, but uh, something that somebody announced, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, and I don't, but uh, mm -hmm. solar panel, uh, you know, this change will increase another 10% uh, the, uh, right. the, the amount of photons uh, turned effectively mm -hmm. to electricity. I know what it was. It was uh, you know, the, the crystal stacking of, uh, of uh, the, the solar the panel, the, the way that it's uh, laid out, and a, a lower cost way to do it uh, to get the architecture right. But mm. in any event, it's so rapid that if we can just stay peaceful, stay <laughs> healthy, uh, do the basics that we need to do, the opportunities are really present. Exactly. Jeff, I Very wanted to bring in a question from earlier from Paul and I sort of, uh, I'm going to sort of spin off of this question to a related one, but Paul was asking, uh, with the pace of globalization increasing so fast, how do you make sure that no one is left behind? And, and I guess I would add to that, um, you're talking a lot about technology and technological advances helping us to move towards a sustainable future, but how do we make sure I mean, I see us in a period where the divides are getting bigger, not smaller. So how do we make sure that no one is left behind even as we make these advances? Professor yeah. Sachs can help us there. <laughs> <laughs> that is a political, social, and moral choice, uh, but it will not happen by a market economy on its own. Uh, a market economy with this technological change will lead to wider divisions. Uh, because uh, basically what's happening is that the returns to labor in the marketplace are going down. The returns to uh, uh, data uh, and uh, certain sets of skills are rising uh, enormously. And we can see that uh, it's the weirdest uh, situation that I've seen uh, as a practicing economist in my 40 years of work in the field, and they're calling it a K-shaped recovery, where a certain part of the economy, the online digital world is rising, uh, and the other part is going down. And so it's not V-shaped or W or L-shaped, it's K-shaped. And uh, if you think about it, uh, Jeff Bezos, um, I mention his name a lot because I, I buy something from him uh, just about every hour of the day, it seems, uh, something from Amazon uh, uh, in this period. His personal uh, wealth has gone up about $80 billion since the start of the year. That's a lot of money, by the way, even uh, from a macroeconomist. Uh, and uh, the, the wealth increase at the top is soaring. And at the same time, uh, life is, the bottom is falling out for tens of millions of people. And so we need a political answer to that question. Retraining, uh, income support. Uh, we're the only country in, in the high income world that doesn't have uh, universal health care as just the most basic. Mm. Uh, we just don't have it. But right. every other country I know, because I work with all of them, Canada or any of the European countries or Japan or Korea, nobody says, oh, what am I going to do with my health care? Because everybody gets it. It's just right. a, a political challenge. So the issue about how to bring everyone along is really a political and a moral mm. issue mm. more than it is a uh, purely economic issue because the pie is getting bigger, but a market system will divide it more unequally inherently unless you have the, uh, the hand of uh, government as a reflection of our shared values to say, no, 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 make sure everyone gets a piece of that larger pie. Mm. Yeah, so uh, Jeff, just returning back to um, some of the economic uh, risk topics that came up earlier, you know, one of the um, things that I think we've all learned from past successes to major global environmental challenges is that science first frames the debate, it frames the issue, and then the public engages with that knowledge and translates that to some kind of personalized risk, you know, how that challenge, let's say ozone depletion and UV skin cancer or acid rain and, um, and uh, water quality, and then, and then industry engages with that uh, public pressure 
to then lead solutions. And so one of the things that I think can be uh, a real turning point uh, that's actually called on from the uh, UN uh, Decade for the Ocean is to have science really weigh in with use-inspired basic science to inform solutions. And this is a really different uh, way of approaching science than certainly how I grew up. But what's interesting is we had this experiment before where when we incentivize the scientists to take on this really risky but incredibly useful science, once you can free up these amazing minds to work on problems that really matter, it totally changes the, the dynamic of how a team of really brilliant scientists and engineers can redirect or can pivot to weigh in and provide knowledge that then shapes markets, it shames, shapes ideas. Absolutely. It just you know, illuminates this future that's, you know, as you say, is just right on our corner. And, and, and I think one thing that I uh, always like to emphasize, and you said it exactly, uh, um, you know, the, the, there's a big difference uh, of science and engineering, although there's some overlap, of course, of what people do, but you take Hui, it does both of them. Uh, it does basic science and it does the engineering. But uh, for me, the engineers are so crucial in this uh, because what the scientists tell us is, oh my God, we've got a problem. What do you mean? Well, this is how greenhouse uh, effect works or you don't understand the oceans. This is what's going on. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, we didn't have any idea. And then the, the scientists also can say, and we have to measure that and be able to model that and parameterize that and so forth. And that I think is, uh, without that, we wouldn't even know what's at all what's happening to us. But then we really need the engineers to say, you know, there's a better way to do this. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when it comes to the energy systems or when it comes to climate change, the climate scientists are vital to say, you better decarbonize. Here's the dynamics. You have 30 years if you want to have a 66% yep. chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C, for example. But it is the energy engineers that say, by the way, here's how you should produce your electricity. And the public doesn't understand engineering very well, uh, actually. You know, the, the practical uh, systems approach. And actually, I think the public doesn't understand very well in general that we live in systems of engineered systems. Mm. So everything we do, how we get our food, how the water supply is safe in our city, how the internet works, how their cell phone works, it is an engineered system, mm. a highly complex, sophisticated mm. engineered system. And we need that engineering to say, uh, okay, here is how we could use our technologies to do this in a safer, smarter way. The economists come in kind of as a cleanup job at the end to say, oh, that's what you mean. Well, then we ought to have a budget allocation or we ought to put a subsidy on this or a tax on that so that your engineering solution is adopted. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, too often, actually, the economists are asked first I can assure you, we don't know anything about what to do, <laughs> except what the scientists and engineers advise. But then the, the job of, 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 an, of an economist is to say, well, you know, business is not really going to be able to do that unless the market is structured in, in this way, or unless we pay for these ecosystem services, mm -hmm. uh, or have tradable uh, quotas on fishing or something like that. And that's the last step, mm -hmm. in my view after the scientists have said, here's the problem, the engineers have said, here is a practical system, and the economists can say, okay, uh, here's how we get it into the budget or uh, into the uh, profit and loss a statement of uh, business. Mm. So, uh, Peter, Veronique, we want to give you uh, some time to get in there. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions from young people. I want to make sure we get oh, those great. in. Um, here's one from Zachary. Um, and and I think I know what Jeff's answer might be, but uh, Zachary asks, as a high school student who's already studying college material, what courses should I be taking in college that will help better inform me on these issues so that I'm able to help make change sooner than later? Um, I have a feeling Jeff might tell him to become an engineer, but what, <laughs> let me just let you all answer the question. 
Um, I'll, I'll share the answer that was given to me by uh, Charlie Hollister, who was a very famous marine geologist at, at Woods Hole. And uh, he said, you know, son, you have to have a year of math, physics, and chemistry to get started on these problems. And the, and the, the rationale behind it was you have to be rooted in the science at a young age because then it lets you take on the really challenging global kinds of questions that Jeff is taking on when you're rooted in that kind of knowledge. And so really um, respecting the science is a, is a really important place to start because you can't go, it's much harder to do it later in life. I think that's a great uh, answer. Uh, and I would also say, at least my experience, maybe uh, I'm, I'm a bit slow in this, but it has been nonstop work for 40 years of just trying to keep up with the knowledge. Uh, so whatever you do, and I think there's so many ways to contribute to these uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, you can do it in multiple fields. Uh, you can do it as an oceanographer. You can do it as a climate scientist. You can do it as an economist. You can do it as an uh, energy engineer. You can do it as a public health specialist like my wife. Uh, you can uh, do so many ways to contribute. Um, but I would, I would add uh, maybe a couple of points. You know, first, of course, rigorous, grounded education. And uh, mathematics really is the language of so much of it's, it's, it is the language of science. So uh, that, uh, to the extent you like it and can do it, do it. Uh, because uh, you'll, you'll use it and you'll need it. But then I would say two other things. Uh, one is, uh, no matter how much you study, I feel, you know, I've been in grad school basically now for 44 years. Uh, <laughs> I, I've never really gotten out of grad school. Uh, they they uh, nicely pay me to continue my studies, but... Um, Basically, I've been at university since 1972 <laughs> and nonstop. You really need uh, lifelong learning. Uh, th this is just uh, uh, part of the reality. The world's complicated uh, and uh, it's so much fun to understand what one can understand, but there's, it's nonstop. <laughs> Uh, it's a great that's, job, though. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a second point. And a third point, I think what uh, both of us have learned in, in, uh, also uh, with the delight of the Earth Institute, working with people in other fields is vital and really a joy also. And Absolutely. for me, the most fun uh, part of being a director of the Earth Institute, and it's true, was I got to call Peter or I got to call Wally Broker. Or I got to call uh, Jim Hansen and say, explain this to me. Because, you know, it, it is, um, most people don't have that incredibly gifted opportunity to pick up a phone. Well, we don't even do that now. Uh, we Zoom <laughs> with somebody. But just to get an answer that's authoritative uh, that is built on decades of knowledge and wisdom and have something explained. And somehow we have to really cultivate this capacity to share knowledge and exchange knowledge because we are in very complex circumstances and uh, we have to work across comfort zones and learn the language of other disciplines, at least in a rudimentary way so that we can uh, kind of understand what our colleagues are mm. telling us. Uh, and for, uh, you, the, you know, uh, what was uh, the name of our, the, our high school student uh, that asked the question? Zachary. 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 Uh, Zachary, keep at it. Keep your interest. Learn you. a lot. It's really fun, really interesting, uh, but it's going to be a lot of work too. We have another question uh, that's, uh, not so much about education, but about action. What are some good ways that young people can help fight climate change? That's from Abby. Um, Vote early as first of all. <laughs> all right. Vote this election. It's really important. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, really help support politicians to understand how central this challenge is. And young people need to vote because honestly, your future is at stake. And uh, 
and I don't know, maybe, you know, the septuagenarians may forget that sometimes, but this is your world and you absolutely have to get out there and be heard on this because it will not be a safe world for you unless you're heard and unless we change course. Mm. What about even younger folks who, who may not be of voting age, someone in, in high school or even junior high school? Is there anything they can do? I know there's often a sense of, of hopelessness uh, about these big issues uh, confronting us today. And, and so what, what would you say to a young person who, who wants to be able to sort of take control if, and do something? I, I would follow Zachary's lead and learn about these issues. Uh, because that's really important. Don't lose heart because the ironic thing is these are solvable problems. They're actually more solvable than people think because if you happen to have the engineer at hand who can explain it to you, they'll tell you the solutions actually. So the solutions are within reach. Don't lose heart. Study these things. And interestingly, uh, by the way, SDG 4, when we looked at the sustainable development goals, that's education for all. And SDG 4.7, <laughs> that's a target of uh, SDG 4, is that every child should learn about sustainable development and learn about the climate system, learn about the oceans, learn about what this is about so that you are empowered to take this on. Mm. And we've got a big program we're going to announce at the Vatican next month because Pope Francis, you know, is so interested in the climate issue and he's written a fabulous encyclical Laudato Si about this. Um, we're launching at the Vatican next month uh, what we call Mission 4.7, which is to work with governments around the world to uh, have universal education on these issues as a universal empowerment of uh, young people, I, I think it will make a huge difference. And final point I wanna make, by the way, if you don't uh, wanna start saving the whole world uh, all at once, uh, work with your city to see what you can do at the city level. Uh, students in a high school working with a mayor in a city can say, what about us? Where's our renewable energy? Uh, what are we doing uh, to move to, say, electric vehicles? Or what are we move, doing to uh, retrofit buildings so that they're more energy efficient? And so students can start working at the city mm -hmm. level for practical solutions. And it's great training uh, to uh, go from the city and you'll uh, be able to see larger and larger aspects or even work in your school. Do you have solar panels in the school? Uh, are you... Uh, tapping into uh, technologies mm -hmm. to reduce the carbon footprint of the school itself? Or what about wastes? Uh, are they being properly recycled or food waste or other things? So I think everybody can learn by doing in this. And uh, it's very gratifying to do that. Mm. That's that's a, a really great message, Jeff. And I we're getting close to, to finishing time here. So Peter, I, I just I wanted to ask if if you what makes you hopeful, and and do you have any other uh, thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up? Yeah, you know it's interesting. I've I've had some time to be out here in nature, um, out in Western Massachusetts, which is where I am now. And uh, I went for a walk actually before uh, today, and. Um, you know, I just found it incredibly rejuvenating and fulfilling to sort of be amongst nature and to kind of appreciate what an amazing world that we live in. And when I'm near the ocean, I feel that uh, tenfold more. Um, you know, that kind of connection to the planet. Lauren Isley uh, was uh, a fantastic uh, writer on natural science. And, and he said, you know, if there's magic in the world is contained in a drop of seawater. And you know, just that kind of fascination with what makes us so special in the world, what, you know, what, what, makes a, what makes life worth living is so much wrapped up in our ability to appreciate the world around us. And that comes from science, that comes from discourse, that comes from a Zoom call, that comes from engaging on these issues. And you know, somehow we've lost that. And I think part of it is bringing that back. 
All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for tonight. But before we close, I do want to say a big thank you to both of you, Jeff Sachs and Peter Domenichel, for joining us tonight for such an engaging and thought-provoking conversation. What and, a joy, um, joy for me. I just want to thank uh, both of you. I want to congratulate Peter for your leadership. And uh, we're really excited for Hui and uh, everything. Uh, you can guide me for anything I can do. Uh, count on that. Uh, and also all of the uh, supporters and friends of Hui and colleagues uh, on the line. Uh, really great to be together with you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Great. All right. Thank you both. Um, and thank you also to all of my colleagues who have been working behind the scenes to help make this and all of our Ocean Encounters events possible. As Hui's new president, Peter has taken on the charge of making Hui the leading champion of science for the common good, an unbiased source of knowledge for solutions-based ocean stewardship and sustainability. If you like what you heard tonight and wanna to support Peter and all of us at Hui in that mission, please consider making a gift now to the Hui President's Fund for Innovation. Um, you can see the website is, uh, the URL to the website where you can do that is up on your screen right now. We also encourage you to join a Hui chapter. You have several options as you heard earlier from Rob tonight, Hui Dallas, Hui New England, Hui New York or Hui National. And again, there's a URL up on the screen uh, where you can find more information about that as well. To everyone who joined us online tonight, we hope you'll tune in again next week, Wednesday, October 28th at 7.30, when we'll have our next Ocean Encounters event of the fall season. It will feature six different artists and performers who all share a strong connection to the ocean. It will be an enchanting evening, so please register and tune in for that. On behalf of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, thank you again. Out where the seas are the deepest and the mysteries the greatest lies our future. The ocean is our last unexplored, ungoverned frontier. The life support system for our planet, inextricably linked to our climate and weather and to the lives and livelihoods of countless people around the globe. But even against the ocean's vastness, humankind can be a formidable force. What happens next demands action that is rooted in scientific understanding and unvarnished truth, because our world stands at a fork in the road. In one direction, we watch the ocean being catastrophically altered beyond its ability to sustain us. In the other, understanding outraces exploitation and we help steward and protect this most precious shared resource. What will be the legacy of the 21st century? Here and now, the world's most impressive collection of minds passionately dedicated to ocean science, engineering, education, and policy has a role to play. With the expertise to know what works and a trusted voice to present the facts as we uncover them, we can shape the future. We can inform governments, businesses, and conservationists we can be the catalyst for change and unleash new knowledge in service of society. It is more than our responsibility. It is the defining moment of our generation. We are Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this is our time.